everybody. What's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking on your Tuesday? Hope you're having a fine, fine time. Glad to see everybody here. Lucas Malago just arrived. He said, now that's a thumbnail. It really is a thumbnail. I don't know what he's talking about, but I'm agreeing with him categorically. Uh, hey, Tom Gully. Good evening, everyone, says the lovely and talented uh, Sunday Jenna. Always a pleasure to see her here. John Zermite says, all right, my respite from that mush mouth sack of garbage water. Who, who could you be talking about? I have no idea. I'm clueless. I'm uh, completely oblivious to whatever you might be referring to. Say, I'm going to tell you today about duck and cover drills. I think it's going to be fun. think you're going to enjoy it. We're going to watch a movie and everything. But if you'd like to right now, you can go to the TomGullyShow.com and uh, there you will find 270 podcasts sure to thrill and beguile you on some subject or topic. And also, you will find our show store. Yes, you will. You can also find that at cafepress.com slash the Tom Gully Show. You can get things like these mugs here. Oh, yeah. If there's one thing you can say about those mugs, they are mugs. Feeling, feeling good, feeling fine with our stylish design. And also, as you know, we are not monetized here. No, no, not yet. So what we got to do is we got to say, please, okay, please. It's in the crawl. Go to paypal.me slash Tom Gully Show, or you can go to our Patreon. That's where I'm, you know, putting all of the things I'm too terrified to actually put for free access on the internet. With all that being said, I think we got a few more. A few more chats here. Julian Zeezer says, if you squint in your eyes, the explosion behind Tom's head makes him look like Einstein with his white hair. The chef is in the house. That's Randy Ramos. He indeed is a bona fide chef, and he chefs things for people all the time. We got classy people, classy people watching this show. They got class. Yeah, you know, when they drink their Mountain Dew, in a plastic bottle, they, they stick their pinky up. Mm. Just like that to indicate class. That's the kind of class we got. At any rate, um, that's, you know, that's about all the chats and things happening here so far. Um, I don't know what else to say. Um, had an ice cream cone today. It was really good. When is an ice cream cone not good? Somebody else bought it for me. That made it even better. If you're uh, young or if you're old, I think you can uh, appreciate the simple joy of an ice cream cone. I'm waiting a few minutes to see if we get a few more people in here. If not, well, then I'm going to start telling you about duck and cover might as well open that up right now we'll get to our uh, topic today and then we will go to the open phone lines and i know how much people appreciate the open phone lines let me tell you boy if there's one thing people can't get enough of it's them open phone lines i uh see here finally a detente with the ice cream truck no it wasn't the ice cream truck did i tell you guys about the other day when it was raining we had really 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 bad heavy rain here it was i think it was end of last week or on the weekend and it was only like 50 degrees out and it uh yeah it had to be a day i didn't do the show so it was on the weekend and you know and I just, I went outside. There's an awning in front of my front uh, entryway. And I walked all the way out to the end of it as he was coming by. And he looked at me. And I just went, what? 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 I mean, I don't, you know, want to disparage anybody's right to make a living. But it's like, no kid is going to run out in 50-degree weather in the pouring down rain to get a push-up. That's my feeling, anyway. 
Kahuna's here, and he says, hey, gang. Hey, Kahuna. Always good to see you. Pause here, as usual. He says, sorry, I'm late. And as usual, I'll say nobody's ever late to this show. Pause. Randy Ramos says, rumor has it the ice cream truck sells more than just ice cream. Check the movie Fridays out. And uh, sometimes disaster can befall the ice cream truck. Just watch the original Assault on Precinct 13 for more on that. Joker Fish is here. Joker, Joker, Joker. He says, hello, everybody. Hello, Joker. Always good to see you. Always good to see you. Well, Suk is here. He's the first one here. He says, shouts out to Big Perm. I don't know who that is. Julian Zizer, they should sell fish, too. They have enough dry ice to keep it cool. I don't know. I've heard that uh, fish makes your toes swell. I don't know. I've never, never experienced that myself, but that's just what I heard recently. Mm, mama. Okay, we might as well get down to brass tacks. Let's get down to cases. I love that saying. Let's see. He dri- Oh, Big Perm drives the ice cream truck. This guy is uh, shaved head, completely bald. Smoking a cigarette. Selling ice cream. People saying hi to everybody. We love a cheerful chat room. So let me tell you about duck and cover drills. And we're going to watch a little movie here to kick things off. It's only two or three minutes long. I may stop it during. I don't know. Um, Duck and cover is a tactic, first and foremost. It's what people are instructed to do or were instructed to do to protect against the effects of a nuclear explosion. Because, you know, there's so much you can do. Um, it is useful, and we'll get into this. It's actually very, very useful, uh, you know, to provide some degree of personal protection outside the radius of what we call the nuclear fireball. But what I'd like to get across the plate here is the fact that to me and to many people of my era and a little bit earlier, um, Duck and Cover was a series of film strips and films and drills that you had to do in school. And they did not candy coat whatsoever why you were doing it. So this guy right here, this fella, way back in the 60s, was doing, and I remember doing this, and I remember seeing the film that I'm about to show you uh, in school. And let me tell you, it was uh, a good time. It was scary. It was, uh, you know, they they, they actually, uh, at the school I was at, provided you, and they gave them to you, and then they took them away after the drill. These little, they weren't dog tags, but they were tags that had your information written on them, uh, and then like a plastic cover. And I, I was always like, oh, plastic cover? I don't think that's going to protect you from anything, but 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 there was uh, things that leaked out amongst the students that they would survive a certain amount of heat and stuff. It was, man, they really worked you over. So I'm going to make myself teeny tiny during what I'm about to show you right now, which is a film strip that we all saw. And uh, we'll just you know we'll just, we'll just get into it here. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is and was. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. That we called Duck and Cover. Dum, dum, deedle, dum, dum, deedle, dum, dum, deedle, dum, dum. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. Can I just say right here, I think it's underselling things at the start of the film, and maybe this was wise on the part of the filmmakers, but uh, to have Bert ducking and covering to the site of what I would call a slightly large firecracker just didn't really... Well, let's continue. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you duck and cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. 
It's also this to, is an official civil defense film also to scare the life out of you. The federal civil defense the administration and, uh, and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the United States Education, Education Association. Association. Produced by Archer Productions Incorporated. Hey, Bert, come on out and meet all these nice people. Please? No. no oh, I'm... all right. We really can't blame you. You see, Bert is a very, very careful fellow. When there's danger, this is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. We all know the... The kids sing prayers right now, probably. I know I was. And um, if I could just point out, yes, this is exactly the way that my school looked back in the late 60s. And I have to tell you, uh, yes, it was in my school was in black and white. Uh, pretty much. Atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready. Can we just review that? This is for school children. And <laughs> it's, uh, first of all, the atomic bomb is dangerous. Check. And it may be used against us. Because that was the thing is that, well, I'll get into the history of it, but uh, many of us, uh, some call us boomers, some call us uh, early Gen X. Uh, <laughs> there was the constant reminder that we weren't the only ones with a bomb and that those could be used against us. In your school, we all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Fire is a danger. It can burn whole buildings if someone is careless. But we are ready for fires. We have a fine fire department to put out the fire. And you have fire drills in your school so you know what to do. Automobiles can be dangerous too. They sometimes cause bad accidents. But we are ready. We have safety rules that car drivers and people who are walking must obey. Now we must be ready for a new danger. The atomic bomb. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. Oh, boy. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you are not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could... Say, why don't you list the ways for us? That'll make me you know, have a nutritious lunch without any worry? Knock you down hard, or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion, it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. You know how bad sunburn can feel. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You guys all know what's coming next. You know how bad sunburn is, don't you? The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like Bert the Turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, they're talking about the atomic bomb, too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? Oh, you'll know, Betty. You'll know when you see the flash. And her teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. With warning is terrifying. Without warning... Well, that's what's going to keep you awake at night for the next two to three weeks. We think that most of the time we will be warned before the bomb explodes. So there will be time for us to get into our homes, schools, or some other safe place. Our civil defense workers and our men in uniform will do everything they can to warn us before enemy planes can bring a bomb near us. By the way, that's the way the bombs were delivered at that point in time. They did not have 
ICBMs, which of course are intercontinental ballistic missiles that could deliver the bomb without the need of any planes. You may be in your schoolyard playing when the signal comes. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Faster than that, probably. Okay, I think, we, I think we've seen enough here. I think you get the picture, don't you? Uh, <laughs> uh, brother, oh, you know, it's, it's good times. It's really great growing up in the, <laughs> the post-nuclear era there. I accidentally closed my thing. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Now we got it back. Hey, we're fine now. We're fine now. Everything's groovy. Nothing to worry about. Whoops. Oh, come on. Duck and cover. I still hear that song in my head. Uh, why don't we get you a great picture here just while I'm doing this? Uh, how's this one? This looks like a great photo. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so duck and cover. That's what it was. It was in the schools. All right. So, as a countermeasure to the lethal effects of nuclear explosions, and remember, we'd only dropped two of them. Now, we had many, 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 many tests, and they did test various things during those, but a lot of the information that we had at the time was garnered from the two bombs we dropped on Japan. And so, duck and cover was actually a calculated measure it was calculated by the government to the tune of the potential of saving 27 million american lives if this civil defense function uh, did what it was supposed to do and you will see that as silly as some of this might seem oh, nuclear explosion atomic explosion you know ducking and covering under that wooden desk is going to help me out well actually Yes, it would, and and more than just in a marginal fashion. Um, immediately after one sees the first flash, what is just intense heat and light in a developing nuclear fireball, you're supposed to stop, get under some cover of any kind, a rock, a mail by anything that you can, if you're not in a school or an office building or somewhere, and then get in that sort of stooped over, prone position, face down, back to the explosion. Uh, do anything you can to cover exposed skin. If you have extra clothes, if you have a blanket, um, sparing that, you just use your hands, you know. Um, in army training, soldiers in the U.S. Army were taught to fall down immediately and cover their face and hands just as these school children were doing. Now, the rapid deployment of school desks and improvised shelters and hallways, that's where we had ours. Um, that is a countermeasure primarily to keep people from being hurt by the ballistic effect of glass and other debris that would, you know, lacerate people and... Uh, prepare them when the slower moving effects of the explosion arrived. However, in the higher blast zones, closer to where the bomb would detonate, uh, building collapses would occur. This position was also somewhat effective in uh, protecting people from injury in that way. And, uh, you know, in, in uh, Great Britain, they had this same program. And they actually sold what were called Morrison Indoor Shelters, which were these little structures that people would run into inside their house that would protect them from a collapse. They were sort of like a reinforced cage. Okay. So anyway, um, duck and cover was also to prevent people when they saw a flash from running to the window. Now, 
a flash, if you think of this like a lightning strike, many times you see the lightning and it's some seconds until you hear the thunder. Well, duck and cover was also a deterrent from getting people to run to the window when they saw the flash and then be hit by the blast wave right next to plenty of available soon to be broken glass. So there were many things about this that actually make sense, even if Bert the Turtle is a little bit silly by today's standards. Um, <laughs> let me get you another picture here. There, there's so much uh, available uh, imagery from this particular program, it's not even funny, which is interesting in and of itself because historically, I'm going to tell you about something regarding the government and judging how effective this was uh, as uh, they weighed it against the expense of this uh, program. Now, with all nuclear blasts, there is kind of a, a measurement that they do, and it all has to do with how close you are to the center of the blast. Makes sense, right? So I'll show you this graph here, distance from ground zero, and it gives you the effect at one hour of the number of what they call rads. It's basically just the effect of any gamma rays or other radiation that comes from a nuclear explosion. And then six hours, it shows you how much further that actual nuclear or atomic effect has uh, traveled, and then 18 hours. Okay, so it's the, the, the longer you're exposed, of course, the further uh, the blast's effects are. And those are radiation effects. Those are not actual physical effects, okay? So ducking and covering would offer very negligible protection against the heat uh, and the blasts, uh, something called ionizing radiation, which you don't want to find out about ever, beyond the range of about zero to three kilometers, which is around two and a half miles. Um, many lives would be saved with duck and cover, especially since at the range beyond two and a half miles or so, the main hazard is not from the radiation, but the blast, the, the physical force that the bomb impacts. Now, the explosion blast wave would take from the, the first sight of it seven to 10 seconds to reach a person standing that same distance from the two and a half miles from the surface of the nuclear fireball. The exact time of that being the speed of sound in the air in that area, which has to do with humidity and barometric pressure and a lot of other things that are, that are you know, calculated into that. Um, for very large explosions, it can take 30 seconds or more after that silent flash for the dangerous blast wave to arrive or to hit someone's position. So imagine you see the flash and you're not ducking and covering, and you start wandering about. Maybe you run out of the building. What was that? Whatever else. And 30 seconds, that's a long time to be doing things before you are hit with a tremendous blast wave. So being indoors, especially below ground, uh, despite the radiation and the thermal zone and all those things, can really, really help you survive. Uh, a, a person by the name of Akiko Takakura survived the effects of a 16 kiloton atomic bomb at a distance of only 300 meters from ground zero with only minor injuries because she was in the lobby of the Bank of Japan in a reinforced concrete building at the time of the nuclear explosion. Okay. Um, Aizo Nomura survived the same blast at Hiroshima at a distance of 170 meters from ground zero. And that person was in the basement of well, what's now known as the Rest House, which was a reinforced concrete building. And that person lived into their early 80s. In contrast, 
a person whose name we do not know, sitting outside the steps of the Sumitoko Bank next to the Bank of Hiroshima, the morning of the bomb, therefore fully exposed, suffered what would have been lethal third to fourth fourth degree burns from the near instant flash. Uh, That's if the slower moving blast hadn't reached them approximately one second later. So now here's something that will explain the effects of lying flat on the ground. Okay. Miyoko Matsubara, one of what they call the Hiroshima maidens, women who survived the blast, when recounting the bomb in an interview in 1999, said she was outdoors less than a mile from the hypocenter of the little boy bomb. Upon observing the nuclear weapon's silent flash, she quickly laid flat on the ground. Those who were standing directly next to her, and those were her fellow students, had simply disappeared from her sight when the blast wave arrived and blew them away. Okay? So, lying flat is a really good thing to do. I mean... Uh, she was only uh, less than a mile away. So there you are. Um, lying prone on the ground will lessen the blast effects. Uh, it also deflects the blast forces because those are, are going upward. Standing close to a wall, even the side of uh, the wall that faces the blast also lessens the effect. Orientation of the body also affects the severity of the effects. Anterior exposure of the body, which is your back, may result in lung injury. Lateral position may result in more damage to one ear than another, while minimal effects are anticipated with posterior surface of the body toward the source of the heat. I'm sorry. The first way, if you face it, you may have lung injury. Um, So that's just, you know, some of the things that can happen. So now... Here's another thing I'm going to show you. And some of you may be aware of this. This is one of the things a lot of people are aware of. Uh, If you can see that sort of stanchion and uh, uh, pipe stanchion there and the shadow on the wall. Okay, that's not, they, they call it a shadow, but it's not really a shadow. What happened when the bomb went off was because of that stanchion being there, when the bomb hit, that created sort of a shadow, but really it's the lightning of everything around it. It turned everything around it. It, you know, superheated it. So it made it fade or turn white. And that section that was protected didn't have that happen to it. Therefore, the shadow. Um, let me see here. Uh... The, the advice that you should cover your exposed skin with anything that can cast a shadow, like a picnic blanket or a newspaper, which if I had played that film longer, they showed a guy with a newspaper. That may seem absurd, but even the thinnest of barriers, like a cloth or the leaves of a plant, would reduce the severity of burns on the skin from thermal radiation, from that flash light. Um, that radiation emitted is ultraviolet visible light infrared range but with a higher light intensity than sunlight and so that combination of light rays is capable of delivering radiant burn energy to expose skin areas and just any barrier anything cheesecloth anything will help you the really important thing is closing your eyes Okay, because if you don't, the damage to your eyes could be temporary or permanent uh, blindness. So there you are. Let's see here. You you guys like reading material? I'm sure you do. There's a little light reading for you. That's an official U.S. government booklet. I wonder who got the illustration job for that. So <clears throat> now the initial nuclear radiation, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's life threatening in the short to medium term. Ducking and covering would, would slightly reduce exposure to the initial gamma rays, especially 
those admitted after that first flash. The initial gamma rays are defined as those admitted from the fireball and following a mushroom cloud, which can reach personnel on the ground for a total of approximately one minute, at which point the intensity of that radiation diminishes and the atmosphere is thick enough to act as a shield against it. Now, half of these gamma rays are emitted in the very first second, and the other half over the next 59 seconds of that minute. So half of it is in the first second. The, the other half is in the rest of the minute. Um, you know, obstacles serving as radiation protection, such as building walls, foundation, car engines, between people's bodies and the radiation emitted from both the fireball and the lower levels of radiation during that mushroom cloud phase, uh, it, it is substantial. Um, and we're talking about every fraction that you're protected. It's not like it's a constant. The longer you're, that you're protected, the more you're protected because the radiation is decreasing. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, let me get to this historical stuff because the rest of this is rather technical. Okay. The long-term survival. Now, a lot of people will say only the cockroaches will survive, a, you know, nuclear war or a detonation of a bomb uh, that started during the height of the Cold War. And that is not correct, uh, as has been heavily scientifically proven. Um, numerous human and agricultural decontamination countermeasures exist for the isotopes of the radiation, cesium-137 and strontium-90, for those of you keeping score at home. Uh, and, and if you use these countermeasures, you can live for a very, very, very long time. If you do not, if you do not, you will begin in a matter of days to suffer the effects of nuclear radiation, which are just absolutely horrible absolutely horrible. Uh, they involve your skin, your teeth. Uh, none of them are pleasant and uh, they are historically not treatable. Um, there are people <clears throat> who survived the, the blasts in Japan that did experience a degree of nuclear radiation that was severe, but they didn't live as long of a life as they would otherwise have lived. In other words, they died 10, 20, 30 years later and uh, not a great, not a great life, let me tell you. Um, the, the thing of this is, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, at a certain point, okay, the U.S. government started to do some calculations uh, and <clears throat> all of these calculations, the Russians got the bomb in 1949. And that's when we began duck and cover because they got smart people. They sat down with a pencil and started to compute the number of people that would survive in one of these attacks. Now, Duck and cover immediately became a part of civil defense drills. And we had civil defense, and certainly they did over in Europe during World War II, and the civil defense volunteers and departments in various cities were still a thing, especially after the Russians got the bomb. But education efforts on the effects of these weapons, including duck and cover, which was one of the biggest programs they had, um, began to proceed... But once classified, this information has now come up, the U.S. war games looked at varying levels of war escalation. They started to see what, what's likely to happen in a scenario like this. With warning and preemptive attacks in the late 50s and earlier 60s, it was estimated that you know we could save 27 million U.S. citizens with civil defense education. Now, at the time, the cost of full-scale civil defense was regarded as a lesser program in effectiveness when they did a cost-benefit analysis than a ballistic missile defense, what, what was called the Nike Zeus system. So that system 
was basically having missiles. <clears throat> I don't know what's going on here today. Basically having missiles that would knock out their missiles. And they said, well, we should really be spending our money on that because that would be more effective than duck and cover. Okay. And because they believed and they were correct in believing so that the Soviets were rapidly increasing their nuclear stockpile, there would be a diminishing return on duck and cover. In other words, the Soviets would acquire and would deploy so many more nuclear missiles than they had previously been capable of that less and less people would be able to survive and therefore duck and cover made no sense and therefore we should spend our money on missiles that would knock out their missiles. So when more and more became known about what it would cost to build a missile system that would take out their missiles, which is something we're not necessarily 100% sure we can do to this day. If you remember the Patriot missiles from the first Gulf War, there was a lot of press about how great they worked. Well, they did their job in many situations and they certainly were lifesavers in many situations, but their actual effectiveness was not that great. It's not that easy to hit a rapidly speeding object with another rapidly speeding object. Now, I'm sure technology has increased exponentially now, and so maybe that's more, uh, more possible than it was back then. But at the time, they started looking at the costs. They started looking at the fact that maybe this doesn't work all that much. And the head of the Department of Defense under Robert F. Kennedy, Robert McNamara, determined that the ineffectiveness of the Nike Zoo system, that knock out their missiles with our missile system, especially in its cost-benefit ratio to other options like duff and cover, uh, he said, no, it's going to be smarter for us to continue with these fallout shelters and with uh, duck and cover and other civil defense. So... Duck and cover became a thing. It stayed a thing uh, until at a certain point they reached a tipping scale. And that tipping scale was <clears throat> when you considered the makeup of the population of the United States at the time, it had moved uh, and it continued to move since the 30s from an agrarian society where about 25% of the people lived in the cities and about 75% of the people lived in rural or country areas to what was nearing the exact opposite. And with that in mind, it's much easier to hit a city and take out just millions of people than it is to try to take out the entire population of the United States that is spread out like it was uh, earlier during the Cold War. And at that point, duck and cover began to slowly go the way of the dinosaur. Now, duck and cover still sort of exists, particularly in areas like the one I grew up in, in Indiana, with tornado drills in some places, say California, it exists with earthquake drills. There are still elements of duck and cover that exist to this day. And I'm sure people practice it from time to time in for emergencies or or any other thing, and I'm sure that there are state laws in almost every state that require people to do certain sorts of drills uh, in the schools and in businesses and other places. So duck and cover, while not as prevalent as it used to be, and certainly not as cartoonish as it was when it first came out in order to teach children, uh, exists in some form or fashion to this day. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of duck and cover why don't we get to your comments and i will open up our phone lines i'll let you know when that has happened <clears throat> as i try desperately to clear my throat which i i don't know what's going up on here let's see here people saying hi to each other i'm gonna back that up because i know i know how much you people love uh talking about it let's see here wow you guys know a lot about this oh man I'm, okay here we go here we go uh Suk says if only the japanese had school desks to hide under well they didn't have any warning uh we can we can do a show on that at some point and i'm sure we will but not only did they not have any warning what would they warn them about it had never been done before uh, to the extent that the Japanese military was like, you can't do that again. 
uh, before we dropped the second bomb. And then we dropped the second one, and they went, apparently they can do that again, and then they finally surrendered. They were not going to surrender after the first bomb. So, uh, you know, double dog dare you. Hughes says, I used to duck and cover when my dad got mad. The fallout from him is worse than anything I feared from the Russians. Uh, I think we all remember that. Randy Ramos says he remembers that. Wild Bill says, I remember that training cartoon. Many of us do. Certainly the song. They played the song on the radio as a commercial for public service. Reverend Wild Bill says, by the way, hey oh, how you doing, Wild Bill? Good old Bert the Turtle. And uh, gotta love those mushroom clouds. They named the mushroom clouds. The most famous of them is, is called Daphne. Uh, that's not the one behind me. It's a more circular one, but. Uh, Joker fish with some sort of uh, ducks. Oh, yeah, ducks and cover. By the way, our phone lines are open at 972-994-6822. Terry Nee says, free gum under the desk. Mmm, so good. Um, fire drill, organized run like heck. Well, it's, yeah. I have a Disney book called Our Friend the Atom. Robert Klein used to do a great bit about the uh, duck and cover drills or the you know emergency drills for the nuclear bomb, and it was there'd be no talking. I want no talking during the nuclear holocaust. It's really funny. I want an orderly nuclear holocaust. No talking. I'd be taking names. Um, Sup, y'all? Says Aku Mugen. Good to see you. I said it right this time. Lucas Malgo says, nothing like the browning of an atomic flash. Made my steaks real dry. Well, dry steak is the only excuse to use A1. Reverend Wild Bill says, the radiation will not go through the desk. Well, it kind of. I mean, it, it uh, you know, look, nuclear winter, the fallout, all that. It won't protect, but, but that, that scientifically proven, it, just any barrier you can get will exponentially uh, increase your chances of survival. Terry Nee says, I'd kiss Betty Sue before I die. The signal means run. Positive Patriot says, do you think the duck and cover actually works? Well, I think we covered that. Um, it's, does, does it, it's, like, it's like a bulletproof vest, what they call bulletproof. First of all, no vest is bulletproof. There's bullet resistant. It can keep the bullet from piercing your body going inside and you know, delivering a hydrostatic shock to your internal organs, but that force still gets dissipated. You know, they, they don't, it's not like you're Superman and ding, 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 ding. No, that, that bullet hitting your body still creates, you know, damage. It still creates a percussive force that is going to result in effect on a human body. And, that being said, duck and cover is the same thing. Is it, is it, you know, are you impervious? Of course you're not. But is it better than, than any known alternative other than, you know, wearing a, you know, lead suit all day? Yes, it, it is. Uh, Souk says calculated by something morons. I don't think so. These guys are pretty smart. Rem Wild Bill says, look at the aftermath in Japan. Where's the desk? Well, I don't think you care about the desk. I think it's the people. <laughs> uh, we, we, they'll make new desks. If only they had desks, Bill. Where's the buildings? Well, the buildings didn't duck and cover. Ha, there. I run rings around you logically. <laughs> dum, da dum, dum, says Sue. Akumugan says the pressure wave was as little as 10 PSI can cause serious damage to unprotected personnel. Yes. Yes, 10 pounds a square inch. Uh, Sook says, I think the burning to ash factor would save you from flying class. <laughs> you guys. Uh, Jokerfish says, we had a fallout shelter in elementary school. Saw those signs every day. Yeah, that nuclear warning symbol, the or orange or yellow thing with the triangles on it. Uh, that was always nice. And you'd see that at the movie theaters, see it at the grocery store, see it everywhere. Terry Nee said, we went to a basement hallway. It was Illinois, so... Already prepared for tornadoes. Terry, you and I both. We had a basement hallway. That's where we went. Uh, that we that we rarely went to for anything. It's where they stored, you know, volleyballs and stuff. Uh, Reverend Wild Bill says, good way to get rid of your... Well, I guess. <laughs> it's, 
Uh, Randy said, that's why I like that show. One day we're going to be talking about uh, that movie, and next day we're talking about a nuclear blast. Well, we'd like to cover a wide variety of subjects here. Totally rad, dude. Speaking of a wide variety of subjects, you'll find that at the com. 270 podcasts, anything from uh, a, a U.S. senator and presidential candidate being interviewed by me um, to a famous actor in the Hercules, the legendary journeys to the guy who wrote and performed the streak to best-selling authors to me at event. It's just a, it's a lot of stuff, man. It's a lot of stuff. You can also go there and you can get uh, stuff in our store uh, or you can go to cafepress.com, the Tom Gully show. And if you could please donate, we'd, we'd really appreciate that. That's paypal.me Tom Gully show till we get monetized. We are going to pass 2,500 hours on this show today so thank you all for watching i do appreciate that or you can go to patreon where all the you know kind of what we'll call alternative entertainment is um i'm a free speech guy and on some of these shows people would ask me in the middle of the show can i curse and i'd say well i you know you can i can't or won't but you can and some of them were topics that 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 are just adult topics they're it's not that they're bad topics they're just things that for grownups. Remember, while Bill says, I always try to learn something new every day. That's why I watch the Tom Gully show. Always something new. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I try. Lucas Malago says, Bill is talking about a different kind of preppers ration H. Preppers. Don't let me start it on that again. Uh, Remember, while Bill says, evening, chef. Hi, Terry. Hi. People saying hi. Lyndon said, I am late. Nobody's ever late to this show, Lyndon, at least of which you. We appreciate you being here. I appreciate your support. Reverend Wild Bill says, hey, Joker, Joker. Every time I hear someone say Joker, I want to go, Joker, Joker, Joker. E hey, by the way, I will do a show on the guy that figured out on the Joker's Wild the pattern of the display on the screen and just sat there and won and won and won and won. I don't know if you guys are aware of that story or not, but I will bring it to you. It's an amazing story. Herb Mob Bill says, Lyndon, you missed Bert the Turtle. Uh, folks saying hi to each other. We do love a cheerful chat room. We really do. 972-994-6822 is the number to call. With the phrase that pays. T T Terry Nee says, we called our nuclear mascot Kitty the Donkey. Because we would kiss our, yeah, goodbye. Suk says, who was the Japanese guy that didn't get enough the first time, so he jumped on a train and got hit the second time? That is, uh, Suk is telling you a true story. There was a guy who was um, in Hiroshima, I believe. I don't know whether he was in, Hir I don't remember the order. I'm sorry. I'm usually smart. I think we hit Hiroshima and then we hit Nagasaki. And he was in the first city when the bomb went off and immediately jumped on a train that took him to his home where he, where he was from and into Nagasaki and then got hit by the second bomb. That's an actual true story. Um, hey, Paz. Hey, Wild Bill. Hey, Reverend. You notice they don't talk about the fallout. Yes. Brett Hollywood says... What's what is the meaning of this? Hey, brother, you tell me, and I'm, we'll both know. Remember, my Bill says illustrations were so complex back then. I remember them well. Uh, Brett, preparations for the next decade coming up. Terry Nee says, "Don't worry, Brett. California will slide into the ocean before this." Remember, my Bill says, "Well, after the bomb, it would be cockroaches and Keith Richards." <clears throat> That's been proven to not be true. Terry Nee says, "My dad worked on Nike radar." Yeah. Man, that, that's some complex stuff there. Very complex stuff. And I think that they theoretically had figured out how to make it work. They just couldn't execute that with technology. They didn't, they didn't have the technology that would allow them to make it happen. So, Paz says, did you hear the guy that survived? I did hear about that. Okay, let's, let's look him up. Let's look up that guy. Right now. Right here. Right now. I'm not one for, I'm not a lag about, come on, open, what are you doing to me?
There we go. Uh, it's not going to. It's, it's not playing fair right now. Not playing fair. <clears throat> I bet I can make it happen here, though. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, he tried to outfax me. Man who survived both atomic bombs. His name was Susomo Yamaguchi. It was a Japanese engineer. Let's get you some facts on that guy real quick. Because that's what we do here. We deal in facts. Wow, only 12 minutes left in the show. I'll tell you what. Tutsumo Namaguchi. I'll have the Tutsumo Namaguchi. He was a Japanese marine engineer who survived both of the atomic bombings during World War II. He died at the age of 93 in Nagasaki, by the way. Um, so there you are. And the story is just as I told it. I mean, I'll get into more details here in just a second. But he lived to the age of 93, so kind of an indestructible dude to a certain extent, I suppose. But uh, come on, Tutsomo. I'll have the Tutsomo Namaguchi with the edamame and the... Uh, Okay, he lived and worked in Nagasaki, but in the summer of 1945, he was in Hiroshima for a three-month-long business trip. On August 6th, he was preparing to leave the city with two colleagues. For those of you keeping score at home, Akira Iwanaga and uh, Kuniyosho Sato, excuse me, was on his way to the train station when he realized he had forgotten his hanko, which is a, a type of identification stamp common in Japan. Returned to his workplace to get it. At 8.15 a.m., he was walking toward the docks when the American B-29 bomber Enola Gay dropped the big one. Yamaguchi recalls seeing the bomber and two small parachutes before there was a great flash in the sky. Because remember, these bombs detonated above ground to do the maximum destruction. Uh, they didn't hit the ground and explode. They were designed to explode uh, a certain number of feet above the ground. And uh, he was blown over. The explosion ruptured his eardrums, blinded him temporarily, and left him with serious radiation burns all over the left side of the top aft of his body. Now, after he recovered from this shock, he crawled to his shelter, and having rested, he set out to find his colleagues. They, too, had survived, and together they spent the night in an air raid shelter before returning to Nagasaki the next day. In Nagasaki, he received treatment for his wounds, and despite being heavily bandaged, he reported for work on the 9th of August. Well, at 11 a.m. on the 9th of August, he was describing the blast in Hiroshima to his supervisor when, yeah, the second one went off. His workplace had put him three kilometers from ground zero, but this time he was unhurt by the explosion. However, he was unable to replace his now ruined bandages, and he suffered from a high fever and continuous vomiting for the next few weeks. Um, when the Allies occupied Japan, he worked as a translator for the occupation forces. In the early 50s, he and his wife, who was also a survivor of the Nagasaki bombing, had two daughters. He later returned to work for Mitsubishi, designing oil tankers. My uncle was a decorated Marine who was at Iwo Jima, and he was uh, wounded there and at Saipan. And I could get into his story sometime. It's, it's frankly, it's, it's amazing. And he went into the car business, and uh, American cars, of course. And when Mitsubishi began selling cars in the United States, every time one of the commercials would come on, he would go, yeah, you know what else they built? They built the engines for the Jap Zero. I mean, he just did not like Mitsubishi at all. When the Japanese government officially recognized atomic bomber survivors um, as Hibakusha, and that's just the designation they had for the survivors of the blasts. In 1957, Yamaguchi's identification stated only that he'd been president at Nagasaki. He was happy with that and happy that he was relatively healthy and he just put it all behind him. But as he grew older, his use of atomic weapons, that the opinion on that began to change. In his 80s, he wrote a book about his experiences called Old Life Well Lived, as well as a book of poetry. He was invited to take part in a 2006 documentary about the 165 double 
A-bomb survivors. There was 165 of them called Twice Survived, which was screened at the United Nations. And at the screening, he pleaded for the abolition of atomic weapons. Became a vocal proponent of uh, nuclear disarmament. And, um, you know, he was recognized later on by his government for all of his... uh, his efforts, and that's Tosomo Nagamaguchi. There you are. Nike Radar. Never got to see the shoe. <laughs> Lyndon says, Tom, I'm a firm believer in almost any case where people survive a catastrophic event, luck was involved. In 1976, I survived a near-death experience where OSHA said 99.9% do not survive. Lyndon, if it is luck, i happy that you were lucky, and we're all happy you're here. And uh, there may be something to be said for what, what you're uh, asserting there. Paz says now they got to worry about hypersonic missiles. Lennon said, it was only dumb luck I survived. You know, that sounds like me in high school. Uh, Wasn't your time to go, brother, says Paz. Uh, Reverend Wabill says, went the way of the dodo bird. Shooter drills. Now they do have shooter drills. Sad but true. Workplace violent drills. Violence is, but yeah, yeah, that's a big one now. Big one in schools as well. Lyndon says, we had drills where you got under your desk and others were crouched against the wall in the hallway. Yeah. Uh, Suk says, can't be too smart to advocate for nuclear war. Uh, Sunday Jenna said, duck and cover reminds me of cloth masks during the start of COVID in 2020. Doesn't help much during a disaster, but they have to offer something to people as a precaution. Well, you'll find that in medicine... um, My father was a hospital administrator for like 45 years. My mother was an RN for the same length of time. In hospital, the best practice for many, many things doesn't necessarily offer huge, huge benefits. Now, some things it does. Some things they found out early treatment of this is you're fine. You don't early treat it and you're in big trouble. You know, there are things that, that they do offer huge benefits. But many things, <clears throat> for instance, when they put you on the nose oxygen, they're doing that because it's a more pure form of oxygen. And you're not necessarily getting a huge benefit from that. But it is better than just breathing the air. So they do a lot of things that are incremental but they're better than not doing them and that's medicine so i voted today vote alfred e newman for president what me worry thanks well wow, uh hugh says no whammies no whammies jake says hello jake nice to have you here always good to see you reverend wild bill says you're correct h first and nagasaki second awesome i was right again another lucky yes uh liked and shared thank you jake Hey, Sunday, Jenna. Hey, Jake. Everybody's saying hi to Jake. Happy hi to Jake. Happy birthday, Terry Nee. Is it your birthday, Terry Nee? Because if it is, happy birthday. Terry Nee, you are a stand-up dude, and I thank you so much for uh, supporting the show. Uh, Send Jake the link. Jake says, how are you doing today, Sunday, Jenna? Sook says he was using lead-based sunscreen. (laughs) The Atomic Man. <clears throat> Akko said, Tom, look up a cloud chamber. It's a simple way to see the particles leave a radioactive shore. I will do that. I'm not going to do it now. People don't understand radiation. They think something with a half mi- life of millions of years is worse than one measured in days. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. The, the, uh, the effects are kind of exponential, but that doesn't mean the the at the end of the first half life that the second half life is a, a picnic uh bomb exploded at 1650 feet above the ground randy says say good night gracie the second one exploded lower than they wanted it to i believe I believe it was the second one it might have been the first one one of the two Reverend Wild bill says brought to you from the makers of japanese zero terry nee says i think my doctor just likes sticking his thumb up my kitty the donkey well, you know, as people get into medicine for all different reasons. Uh, I don't know. Is there another show coming on at 8 Eastern? Anybody know? Because if there is, I'm going to be like the Reverend Al Green and get up on out of here. If there's not, well, then we've got time to goof around. Roku hackers breached 15,000 accounts and are selling them online. I don't even know if I have a Roku account, to be honest. I have a Roku TV but I don't think I've signed up an account with anything on it. 
by the way, Arsenal defeated Porto in the uh, round of 16 of the Champions League today in penalties, 4-2. to two. Ha ha. Oh, Shuley's coming on at 8? Okay, then I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. Uh, let's do this. Whoops, sorry. Sunday Jenna says, yes, Rico, I think. Oh, man, well, I got to watch that, just like all of you guys do. I will thank you all for being here. It was a blast. And, um, you know, I hope you guys enjoy their show. Tom, thank you at always, TSN. Yeah, like, share, subscribe. It costs nothing to like the program. Uh, I could actually go for 15 minutes because they've been starting late and they're going to play 10 minutes worth of songs. But I won't. I'm very good about that. I have 45 seconds left. Like, share, subscribe doesn't cost you anything. Does me a big favor with the algorithm. If you could donate, fine. PayPal, not me. So it's Tom Gully Show and Patreon. That would be super awesome. It would really make my day. There's merch. There's other things. Mostly, it's you being here. And I can't thank you enough. And so, you know, with all that being said, I think the only thing left to say is, um, till next time. We'll see you next time.